people back in the day were smarter than we are today. Now, I'm gonna show you one of the most creative things I've ever seen in the world of carpentry. I've never heard anyone talk about this other than, of course, Brent Hull, where I got this off one of his job sites we were working on. This comes from that 1920s historical house, so we're talking 100-year-old stuff here. But before we get into the really cool detail that I wanna share with you guys, I got this piece right here from that house. They were gonna toss this, uh, the cleanup crew. So I was like, don't throw that away. Let me ask real quick. So I went and asked the project manager and he's like, we don't need it. You can take it. They were gonna throw it away. So I got this piece and I need to come up with something to do with it. Need some ideas. We'll get creative, leave a comment down below and tell me what I should do with this thing and you could possibly win yourself a free Dewaki tee. I've got a ton of these right here. Small, medium, large, XL, unfortunately no two XLs, but yeah, let me know if I choose your comment, You'll, I'll send you a free shirt. So how about that? So let's get into the detail. All right guys, check this detail out right here. This is absolutely amazing. What we have here is a two and a half inch basic flat stock profile. You can see the edges are rounded over. Not really much to it, right? Really dressed down casing, especially coming out of that house we've been working in. You can see it had a shoe molding back band there. It's a basic shoe, just half by three quarter round profile. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Richard, why would you bring this home? I know, I know bringing this carved profile, this ornate stuff, that's pretty cool, but I mean, this, really? What's so good about this? This is in like 100% of homes across the world. You're gonna have a trim going around your door. It's gonna have a 90 degree, 245 miters. What's the big idea? Well, here's the big idea. This right here is such a cool detail. I've got two of these right here, that one, and this one over here. I've got this one flipped backwards so you can see what's going on behind the scenes here. So check this out. So here's what's going on under the hood of this casing here. Behind that just standard 45 degree miter right there, you've got this technique I've never seen before until Brent showed me this. This is absolutely, just blows me away. The techniques that carpenters would have used like over a hundred years ago. I mean, this is probably going back before this house was even built. But I don't know what to call this. I'm just calling it like a hexagon lock ring because if you look at it, it's not a true circle. And this miter would be locked together for eternity if we didn't tear these out. Now, if you look over here, look at that. I took it out and you can see the shape there. It's circular on the outside of that cut there where it recesses, but in the middle, it's that hexagonal shape, so it locks in. You couldn't really have a true circle or else it would probably just fall out. And that ring right here looks like something they probably just had like a, uh, like a blacksmith make for them, or maybe they even made this on site. But it's just a ring bent into that hex shape, and then it's got a little weld right there up top. And that allows the thing to lock together. But I'm just amazed by this, the, the kind of quality, the kind of care that they put into something like this just for little flat stock casing with a shoe mold back band. I mean, they put this much effort into it. I mean, this right here is one carpentry detail. I never would have guessed was behind the scenes on this little casing here. I would have guessed, you know, some, you know, lock nailing together where you drive a nail into each casing. I've talked about that many times. Some glue, some clamps, maybe a biscuit, maybe like some kind of metal spline or something. But this right here is just too interesting. I had to share this with you guys. It is wild. So now that you've seen the backside of this, let's go back over here to the one I was showing you guys in the beginning. And you can see, I mean, these miters are still super tight. Uh, all things considered, the age of them, what they just gone through as far as tear out. I mean, the technique has definitely done its job. It's definitely served its purpose. And here's a modern day bad example. This is a miter in my daughter's room up here. And you can see it's already separated. And this is from 2006. So that's obviously a big problem. I see this on a lot of new homes and it's just 
just really bad. I mean, we've got to do better than that. The solution that most people would find to fix this is to caulk that. And even that just makes it look worse. But personally, my solution for this is just to rip it all out and then take it to a dumpster fire and cook some s'mores with it or something like that. And then just wins or won this entire house. These are the kind of things where I feel like I'm some kind of investigator, some like detective, like I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. Cause in my mind, I wanna learn everything there is to learn about this trade. I wanna go take it as far as it'll go. And this right here is like finding a piece of evidence to work for your case. And it's just really cool. That's, that's just kind of how my mind works. But let's lay this thing down and get a closer look at it. So the first thing I thought of when I picked this up, I had a couple of thoughts actually, but the first one was this reminds me exactly of how we pre-assemble our wainscot and door casings today. And if you've been watching the channel for a while, you know our preferred method of doing that is with pocket screws. So I use my Castle TSM-12 machine to make quick work of something like this. So if I were to replicate this pre-assembled door casing modern day, which I have done on this channel many times, it would be with pocket screws. I'd probably just drive or cut two pockets on this top header right here and then drive those two screws into the legs. So that's how I would replicate this today. And that is a nice strong joint. And with the glue and everything, that's a good to go method right there. But another thought that I had that came to mind when I picked this up was, I've had several comments on my channel about the pre-assembly method. People would always tell me, why are you pre-assembling? What's the point? Just nail those pieces in place. Well, you haven't been doing carpentry that long, at least finish carpentry, if that's your mentality. Because the reason we pre-assemble, I've talked about this before, but is the walls. No walls are perfect, no ceilings are perfect, no floor is perfect, so pre-assembling really saves you a ton of headache and gets you a really high quality finish, like face frame quality finish on all your joints with a little bit of sanding. So those are my initial thoughts on this. So let's lay this down and then I'll give you my theory on how they accomplish something like this and if this is still something that would make sense doing today. So we'll get a tight shot on this here and please feel free to chime in in the comments below. I'm gonna tell you my theory, but I'm not 100% sure this is how this happened, but check it out. First thing you would have to do is obviously cut your 245s on your casing. You would then need to bring those together and clamp them somehow so that when you do this hexagonal ring technique here, they don't separate on you because if they move a little bit and you go to put this in, you know, it's gonna make your miter off. You know, may not be that big of a deal on a flat stock, you know, plain profile like this, but if they did this on anything that had any detail in it, it would definitely be an essential. But it looks like they did. I've got perfect matching up here down by the heel of the miter, same thing at the toe. So they clamped this together somehow to get this technique started. Then once they got these clamped, they would definitely have to drill out this space right here. And I was thinking about this. They probably did this with a hole saw and I've got one right here. So here's a hole saw for those of you who don't know, but this is a three and a half inch, way too big for what's going on here. But you see here, we've got this drill bit. That's the guide that kind of guides the outer teeth of this. So when you go down to drill on something, this thing, you know, if you didn't have that, this would catch like crazy. Anyone who's ever tried to do that knows it's really kind of impossible to make that happen. So I didn't see any damage right here in the center from a bit like this. So I'm not quite sure how they did this. I think one theory could be maybe they had a drill press on site and they, you know, didn't need a guide. So, or maybe they had some type of other bit, but even like a Forstner bit or something like that, I would expect, which that wouldn't really work because I would take out all this material. So it definitely need to be like a hole saw or something, but I'd expect to see some kind of guide for that right here. So that's already got me a little, you know, thrown off. I don't know how they would accomplish that without that. Drill press is my best bet. So I talked about this already. This is like a hexagon shape ring. This is that one from the other one. And what I think I would do is once I had this, you know, hole cut out right there, I would then lay this on there. Cause you gotta think the, uh, the teeth on that hole saw, they're not gonna give you 
this wide of a cut for this ring to fit. So I would lay this kind of as central as I could, you know, in that hole, and then I would just trace it. So lay this ring down, trace it there. And then from there, honestly, it would probably just be the chisel work. Just chisel that out, you know, make sure that hexagon shape is in there. So when you go to pound this thing in, it, it fits in and it locks in. And that little bump right there, which is a weld where this thing's welded together, that actually helps it lock in right there because I can see that thing is dug into the wood and you know, it's, it's kind of acting as like a little grab. So like almost like a clamp effect that's not gonna let this thing spin around. So that is essentially my theory on this. If you guys have any other thoughts, I really don't know how they made this original circle without some kind of damage right here from a drill bit guide. But, you know, drill press without a guide is kind of my best bet. You could, you could accomplish it that way. But other than that, I mean, really awesome hexagonal ring technique for holding miters together. I always say this when we dig into something like this, I really wish YouTube was around back then because these guys could have shown us how to do it and how cool would that be? So there you have it guys, some really awesome details going on here in these old houses. I don't really have room to keep this stuff, but I feel kind of bad just tossing it out. Uh, I might just kind of cut this section out and throw it in my molding bag that I take with me to estimates and stuff like that, or just keep it and frame it in some kind of class case. It's just really that cool to me. So I'll figure out something with this and I'll just kind of toss the rest of it. But hey, don't forget, leave me a comment on what I should do with that ornate molding because I've got tons of shirts right here. I think I've got like 120 in here. So even if you don't win, feel free to support the channel by purchasing one of these below. I'll put a link at the top of the description. Other than that, guys, let me know if you have any questions. Please leave some feedback on these miters, on how this came together. Tell me what I should do with that ornate piece of molding. And other than that, I will catch you guys on the next video.